listening to Operation Self Reset with Jacob Naraki. going on resetters this is operation self reset the one and only place to change the person you are right now to that person that you know you can become and how do we do that it all starts with our mindset right it's all about just believing in ourselves the moment we wake up and knowing that change can start instantly we don't need to wait until next week or the new year or after thanksgiving or after christmas or whatever it may be start right now you want to start a diet start right now and work hard to eat healthy until Thanksgiving. And then after Thanksgiving, work that off, continue to go on that diet, and then when Christmas comes, just pig out on Christmas, and then hit hit it right back up. Don't think for a second, I'm gonna wait till the new year, it's not gonna work. Do you know, fun fact, do you know that gym memberships increase by 98% when it's two weeks before the end of the year, And did you know the most cancellations come in March, before the 15th of March, most people cancel? Fun fact. So if you own a gym, you're going to make a lot of money coming up, and then you're going to lose a lot of clients (laughs) in a couple of months. So there you go. That's my fun fact. And also, too, did you know by increasing the times that you smile throughout the day has the effect of over 200, 200 candy bars, pure chocolate we're talking about, like cocoa beans. And you know cocoa beans have a stimulant called caffeine, and caffeine makes yourself feel better, you feel more alert, more awake, all that stuff. So smile more. Try hanging that on your face. Give it a try. Wake up and go, you know what, today I'm going to be Mr. Smiley, and you're going to be smiling from ear to ear all day. And you know what's probably going to happen? Your coworkers, your friends, your family, or whatever, they're going to be looking at you and going, why are you so happy today? You you never smile like that. <laughs> so throw them off their game and just tell them, hey, I'm Mr. Smiley now. So you better, you better enjoy it because this is how I'm going to be for the rest of my life. Give it a try. It should increase your overall well-being. Let me know what happens. Hopefully it's a positive. You know, you don't get smacked or something for having a weird grin on your face and they're like, hey, you know, this is a pretty, pretty serious matter. Why are you smiling? So there you go. That's your fun fact for the day. And before we get into today's interview, it's with Brian Franklin. He is a business coach. And you're thinking, Jake, business coach? We don't have businesses. This is about changing ourselves from the inside out. It's about our own personal well-being. Well, Brian has a lot of great tips that he talks about not only in his material for enhancing businesses to get them more money or more revenue, but also to a lot of the things that he has learned throughout his time and career are not always related to business. Majority of the time when people or businesses are not making the funds or making the marks or just getting that revenue that they expected, Usually the problems are not because of the product, not because of the campaigns for commercials. It's because of the the leadership and also to the leadership mindset. There might be something affecting the gentleman or lady that owns that business or is running that corporation that is holding them personally back. And he digs deeper than just going, well, you know, this is a great way to enhance revenue by doing A, B, C, and D. No, he looks internally at the people to figure out What is going on with them to see the effect that's going on in the business? He has found time and time again that the CEOs or the owners or the founders, whatever they may be, if they have a poor personal life, it affects the business life. Now you're thinking, interesting, that's a good idea. I can see the relationship. But do you really? Do you do we associate when things are going bad, when we're losing money, when we can't understand, wow, why is our money, I always feel like I'm broke, or why are my cars always breaking down? Why am I always so angry at being stuck in traffic? If you take a reflection on yourself, a lot of the problems, a lot of the ideas stem back to yourself. You're always yelling at people in traffic because you maybe are holding back a lot at your own personal home. Maybe you're having bad relationship problems, maybe you're having bad financial problems, just something else is going on about you. It's not the traffic that's driving you nuts. There are other things that are built up that are covering up the main problem. The key is to uncover those ideas, to figure out what the true problem is and how can we solve the actual problem. 
And that's the thing Brian talks about a lot is identifying the true problem. It's not the little things, you know, it's not the traffic, you know, maybe you could go a different route, use side streets instead of the expressway. But that's not going to be the main reason why you still have these underlining issues. So the key is to find them, uncover them, and to solve that exact problem for the better, for the better you. So Brian, amazing individual. I'm so happy to get him on the podcast. Uh, the way I found out about Brian, he has a TED Talk called, and the the title was pretty intense. It's called The Most Dangerous Question on the Face of the Earth. And so I was uh, pretty intrigued by it. So I checked it out and I contacted him. And fortunate enough, he is on the podcast today. And he gives a lot of great information, not only on ways to discover the problems that are going on in your own personal life, but about leadership too. And I don't even know how we get on the subject of leadership, but it flows really nicely because we are all leaders individually. We all take command of our own personal lives and then we take command of our family and maybe some may or may not take command of the business or the job that you are currently in. But the key is how do we become a better leader? How do we become more of a standard in our own job? How do we get recognized for doing hard work and completing our goals. And the cool thing that Brian and I really discussed that I I kind of moved in a direction that maybe wasn't appropriate, but I talked about brown nosing and how some of the things that he referred to is brown nosing. And we actually dug deeper into the real meaning of brown nosing compared to working hard and trying to stand out from the other individuals within your own workplace. So really cool, interesting interview. And the good thing for you is it's coming right up. So there you go. Um, but one other thing before we dive into the interview, because I keep saying that dive into the interview, just like we're on a diving board and we're going to dive into a pool, a pool of words and ideas. Um, there is a book that I currently just read. It's called Fearless, Creating the Courage to Change the Things You Can by Steve Chandler. Pretty cool, interesting topic. And I'm not going to say you need to buy it or anything like that. That's up to you. But he has one quote in here that truly um, made me think in a different direction. And it's one of his ideas. He The idea is focusing on the big get, quote unquote, is a recipe for fear. And the one thing that he said in here that was pretty, pretty amazing, it, it goes like this. Most people focus on the big get. They want to know what their efforts will get them. But the final truth is surprising. Life focused on what you're going to get is always less abundant then life focus on what you can give. Because the one, one, quote unquote, giving requires creativity and courage, while the other, quote unquote, getting is just another form of fear. Pretty intense and pretty impressive quote there, and it's pretty deep, so I put that in the show notes, but the thing that really struck me there Zig Ziglar is a huge icon to me. He's a motivational speaker. He Well, he, he passed a few years back. He he fell down some stairs at his old age, and he had some serious health issues that were caused because of that fall. And I was lucky enough to see him at a Get Motivated seminar that came to my uh, city. And one thing he always says time and time again in all of his books and ideas and CDs and paperwork, all that crazy stuff, he talks about the more you the more you give, the more you receive. And he talks about it in 10,000 different ways, but that's pretty much the underlining truth. The more you give, the more you receive. So for the people listening that want a quick little tip to really take action and do and kind of a challenge for yourself is start giving more. Maybe start just being a better friend. Start just enjoying your own personal life to let other people see it. You see a great sunset, sunrise, or you just had a really good cup of coffee. You know, tell people about it. You know, tell them things that you personally enjoy So in the long run, you can start receiving things when you don't even know it. The more you give, the more you receive. So there you go, a fun little uh, topic you can try to implement into your own personal life. So there you go. It's a little gift from me to you. You're welcome. So no need to send presents or anything to me. It's, It's okay. But if you want to, I'll give you my address. But anyway, it's not about me. It's not about me, right? Now let's take a listen to the interview with Brian Franklin. Hey guys, and welcome back to the podcast. Today we have a special guest. His name is Brian Franklin, and he is considered the $10 million coach. Brian, first off, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us on Operation Self Reset. My pleasure, my pleasure. 
Good. Um, and for the people that might not know who you are, uh, do you mind giving us a quick little background of uh, kind of your bringings and and what brought you to where you are today? Sure. Well, you know, um, first of all, I've, I've been super fortunate to work with some of the just some of the most exciting and smartest people in Silicon Valley as clients and help them with their uh, their own leadership and their ability to lead companies and um, lead strategic thinking. Um, so I've helped seven companies reach a billion dollars in sales for the first time. And, uh, you know, these are co- companies um, like Apple and Google and LinkedIn and, you know, the Microsoft have all been my clients. And, and um, you know, I started out uh, coaching, actually, um, working with my mom. My mom had been one of the first executive coaches in the country. She was doing that when she used to say she was a coach and people would say, well, what sport? You know, because there's... No one had ever heard of executive <laughs> coaching, um, and uh, um, she was doing uh, the training, uh, the business training for Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People book. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt, but before we continue with the interview, I spoke with Brian off of the mic, and we talked about the habits from that book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. His mom uh, really taught that series, the course, and then also, too, Brian really learned the course, and it really gave him direction and depth, um, not only to his own personal life, but when he's able to help people in the coaching industry. And he highly suggests everybody either listens to it um, or buys the book or whatever. But if you guys are interested in getting this book for free, head on over to audibletrial.com forward slash OSR. You do need to sign up for Audible, um, but as a new member, you're able to get any book out of the 100,000 books that they have for free. It's a free audio book. It's about three hours, and it goes over all of the seven steps for being a highly effective person. So I highly suggest you guys go on out and listen to it, read it, uh, share it with your friends, family, whatever. But um, if you want to get the audio version for free, head on over to Audible Trial dot com forward slash osr and type in seven habits of highly effective people and also too just being open and transparent if you guys use that link audibletrial.com slash osr i do get a little reimbursement for you guys signing up Um, i'm not trying to scam anybody i really believe in improving our lives through education and a lot of times people don't have time to read anymore. So Audible books are as important. You still get all of the great information and it truly helps you transform your life. Um, also too, if you're interested in supporting OSR, it's a great way to help improve the podcast with quality and better interviews and everything like that. So I appreciate everything you guys have done for me and I hope I'm giving you guys the content that you need. So um, there you go. I'm done with that. Back to the interview. Thank you. Um, and, uh, I, I had, uh, a business in the entertainment industry doing sound design for movies. When I sold my business, um, she said, why don't you come work for me? And I said, no way. I'm 27 years old. I'm not going to go work for my mommy. You know, you're right. crazy. And plus the coach, you know, and hold people's hands and sing Kumbaya, you know, just didn't sound like anything <laughs> I wanted to do. Um, but she said, well, why don't you check it out while, you know, while you're trying to figure out what to do next, why don't you come take a client or two? And, um, and so I met with a, a startup company and a couple of young people, some founders, and they were having some difficulties with their team. And uh, I just fell in love with um, the idea of leverage and leadership that, that you could, just through a conversation with someone, completely change their future. And, uh, and so I started, uh, you know, going at it full time. And uh, within uh, a couple of years, I had uh, my own practice and all my own clients and uh, was starting to make over a million dollars a year coaching. Uh, which put me in the top, I don't know, 1%, 1% or 1% of 1% of coaches sure. in the country. Um, and I've been doing that since 2000. Um, and then uh, 2008, uh, I met uh, my wife, Jennifer, and we started taking everything I had learned from uh, working in Silicon Valley and everything she had learned as the president of an environmental chemical company. Um, she was bringing over 40 really disruptive uh, biotech products to market including a, carbo- a carbohydrate-based cancer treatment and uh, you know, a, a treatment for inks and paint that removed all of the harmful VOCs out of the emissions. So we took everything we learned together and started helping entrepreneurs. And since then, we've helped about 1,000 or 2,000 entrepreneurs, somewhere in that range, um, build six, seven, and eight-figure businesses. So that's kind of what brings us, uh, brings us to this conversation. And I think you 
uh, found out about me that way and, and my work with entrepreneurs and said, you know what, entrepreneurs have successfully done some of the things that you talk about at your uh, podcast in terms of overcoming fears and doing a self reset. Right. So could you talk about that self reset? And I'm and I'm delighted to be here to do that. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, congratulations on your success and working with those. Uh, you know, level A companies is is a great, uh, really awesome. I mean, it's unbelievable. And considering where you uh, went from to where you are today, uh, very impressive. But so let's kind of dial it back. You know, you you go into these people and like one of the set, one your first customers that you had. You know, you walked on into this little startup. And, and these people are, are trying to figure out the direction. You know, the leadership was off. Their fears are overcoming them. They, they might have a good business plan. They might have a horrible business plan. But what were the kind of the reoccurring fears that people were coming and asking you about? Do you mind sharing those? Sure. I think the, the, the number one fear that leaders have is that they're something that they're not paying attention to, that they don't know, uh, that they aren't aware of is going to end up being the critical factor that takes them, that takes them down. Um, you know, the, the biggest fear I think of a CEO is the things they don't know they don't know. Sure. Um, once you, uh, you know, once you reach a certain level of leadership, um, then you understand that once you understand a problem, you can pretty much tackle it. So if you have, if you have a problem identified properly, then it's just a matter of time to get the resources you need or get, you know, get the help you need, talk to people who've mastered it and um, do whatever it takes and take care of the problem and fix it. Um, so the, the biggest fear really is what about the problems I'm not aware of? What about the stuff, you know, the aspects of my personality that I, I'm not aware of, the aspects of the marketplace that I'm not aware of, the um, team dynamics that are going on behind my back or in a way that I don't understand, you know, and how do I deal with those? I think that's probably the biggest fear that, that leaders have. Um, and again, it comes from that understanding that, um, that if you, uh, if you, once you understand the problem, once you have I correctly identified the problem, it's just a short matter of time before you fixed it. And that's actually, uh, I think a really useful frame for your listeners too, because, um, you know, I, I've had the experience many times where I've, had a problem in a relationship or a a leadership problem or a problem in terms of my own kind of motivation that was lasting years. And I kept trying to fix that same problem again and again and again, but, uh, and it it wasn't being fixed. (laughs) And then, um, uh, when I actually fixed it, it was because I realized that whole time I identified the wrong problem. And you can almost guarantee if you haven't solved a problem that you've identified, if you haven't solved the problem that you're trying to solve and it's been two or three months, then I guarantee you have not identified the right problem. And there's actually some other corresponding problem, which is really causing the effect that you're concerned about, um, but you haven't identified what it is. Um, so uh, just as an example, um, I, uh, I had a, a private equity company at one point. We'd raised a bunch of money, and we had um, uh, we'd bought several companies, uh, five or six, I think. And uh, the companies weren't doing well. They were, you know, every month they were posting results that were worse than our expectations. And every month we reset our expectations even lower. And then the following month they'd fail to meet even those. And um, I really drilled into uh, into the spreadsheets and into the analysis of, you know, what are our customer acquisition costs and, uh, you know, um, the people managing those businesses, I was, you know, really getting down on them like, hey, you know, you're not paying close enough attention to the numbers. And uh, it, it went on for over a year uh, until ultimately that fund failed. Hmm. Uh, and um, we ended up not being able to return the money that we borrowed to start the fund. We had to call the investors and tell them that they lost their money. And it was probably one of the worst days of my life. Honestly, it was the day I had to make that phone call. Um, and it was uh, about six months later that um, my own spark and my own passion started to return. And I realized that we'd been solving totally the wrong problem all the way along. We'd been trying to solve a mathematical problem where, you know, treating the business more like a set of numbers. And the real problem that was causing the businesses to decline was that we had taken away the founders when we bought the company who actually cared about the customers. Uh, Who actually, you know, one might would say uh, they were passionate about their products, 
But underneath that passion, it really wasn't that they were passionate about the products. It's that they actually loved the customers and they wanted the customers to have a positive experience. They wanted the customers to benefit from the product. They cared whether or not, you know, the customer was delighted or whether they were just, you know, satisfied. And so we've been trying to solve the wrong problem. We've been trying to solve a mathematical problem when the actual problem was a, was a problem of the heart. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that wake up call has forever uh, changed um, my understanding, my attitude, and that's uh, that's when um, you know before that my business and my income hadn't grown; it had stayed the same for five years every year, and then since then it's just grown and grown and grown. So, um, yeah, interesting. Uh, that's just an example of solving the wrong problem. And at any time you're beating your head up against the wall for more than three months, I guarantee get some reflection from a mentor. Uh, or a community of people who have solved already the problem that you're that you're looking at because you're probably looking at the wrong one. Sure, you know, and that has you know, for the people that might not have a startup or the entrepreneur mindset or whatever, you can relate that to your daily life. You know, if you realize, man, I just can't seem to have a long term girlfriend or boyfriend. All right, man, my bank account is always drained. You know, before I, my next check comes in. You know, there's a lot of internal uh, things that. You might always blame it on, oh, well, you know, a tragic event came up. Oh, my car broke down or, oh, something had to get fixed. But like you kind of stated, it has to do with almost a personal reflection on yourself. And a lot of people take that that pain and they put it out there and they try to find what's affecting them. But yet it's affecting them from the inside out. It's really affecting their lifestyle, the way they think, act and, and believe in themselves. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Sure. You know, uh, another example I always see people trying to solve their own problem is in their relationships um, you know yeah. one of the most common relationship complaints after a few years is that uh, it's not as exciting in, in the bedroom as it used to be and maybe sure. their, yeah. their partner is not as attracted to them um, so you know I, I've spoken to I don't know dozens of men who are like hey man you know what do I do my my wife's not it's hard for me to turn around the way I used to and <laughs> they keep trying to solve the problem of how to be more seductive in the bedroom when actually what's occurred is that the rest of the their life together has gotten frayed and the the woman a, any woman who has to keep track of lots of details is going to be less in her feminine and less ready to be seduced so when they what the what they actually need to do is you know, make sure the bills are paid on time, pay the unpaid parking tickets, take the trash out and clean the garage. And when you do that, suddenly that frees the woman's mind up and then uh. you can be Casanova in the bedroom and it works. But if those things are not taken care of, then a part of her consciousness is tracking all that stuff, which means she actually isn't available to you. So that's just another example of, you know, you don't, you can't always dig the well where you see the symptom, right. expect the cause of the problem to be there. A lot of times it's something totally different and there's no way you'd ever find that from inside the situation without getting the reflection of a mentor or with a community or with other people who've already experienced the problem and experienced the solution. Yeah, that's so, um, very well said. Great example too. Um, and so it sounds like not only are you helping people with business problems, you know, ah, oh, man, just this month or the last couple of months have been really horrible, blah, blah, blah. A lot has to do with the personal symptoms. You're almost like a life coach. Would you say you're more of a life coach than you are a business coach or would you say it's a 50, 50? You know, um, I don't, uh, I don't really, uh, take those labels very seriously, um, what I, uh, what I help people do is identify the core of really who they are. What's, what is the best about them? Okay. What's, what is the, what's their, their, the, the, their highest moment of greatness? Mm -hmm. What's that look like, feel like, taste like, and then how can they express that in every of the area of their life, primarily through their business? Although, yeah. uh, you know, if you are, let's say you're a manager at a company uh, and you want to show up as the best manager you can, if your home life sucks, there's no way you can do that. Right. So uh, even though I would consider myself more paying attention to the business results as the metric of success, um, the causal factors that lead to your success at work um, are as much to do with your personal life and your eating habits and your um, private fantasy life and all that crazy stuff as it is to actually kind of the tactics that you're using in your meeting with your boss that day. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly when you count for not just your productivity, 
but when you account for also your fulfillment and the degree to which that you get, you derive satisfaction from the work you do, which I think is one of our fundamental rights and one of our fundamental desires as human beings. We all want to derive satisfaction from the work we do. And um, so, you know, one thing I'd encourage all your listening, listeners to do in terms of a self-reset is reset your expectations that you're going to derive maximum satisfaction from every activity in your life, from your marriage, from your relationship, from your girlfriend, from your friends, from your work, and from your hobbies and from your free time. If you're not deriving maximum satisfaction, figure out why, get to the bottom of it, of it change that, or change the scenario, change the situation. Yeah, no, again, and you know, sorry to call you a life coach light, or a business coach, but it's the, the traditional staple that we put associated with people helping other people, you know, so, uh, okay. you know, it's just the classic term, but, and one thing too, you know, um, a lot of research shows, you know, if you are an unorganized person, your mind is unorganized too, and that relates to your home, your business, whatever, and uh, a lot of those things that you, you just said, you know, kind of straightening up everything in your personal life will straighten up everything in your business life, and that applies to, you know, the person. And, you know, if you if you have a uh, a job that's maybe not um, very high paying, you know, but that also applies to the people that are getting paid millions of dollars per year. So it, it's just life lessons that we all need to uh, utilize and, and l- learn from and try to implement in our own lives. So let's I kind of, make, yeah, go I on. Make a comment, just one more comment sure. on that before we move on, which is because you, you make the distinction between a high paying job versus a low paying job. And, sure. and uh, we think that money is going to make us happy. And that getting paid a lot is what will give us satisfaction. And, and until you've had that experience, you get really convinced that that's going to do it. Um, and you just have to take my word for it uh, that it doesn't make you happy. <laughs> it doesn't create satisfaction. And all you have to do is think of yourself five years ago or ten years ago when you dreamed of making the money that you're making now and uh, realize that it didn't work. It didn't actually make you feel the way you thought it would make you feel uh, so, um, I, I'm not against getting paid a lot of money. Go ahead and do that if it pleases you. Sure. But what you're really looking to do, which can be done in any job, it can be done at the most basic entry level, eight dollar an hour job, uh, all the way, all the way up to the CEO, is create the maximum positive impact with your presence in every situation. Create the most value as you possibly can for all of the people around you. So if you're in the uh, mail room and you're working with other people in the mail room, make the people that you're working with, make their jobs as easy as possible and as productive as possible. And if you interface with someone outside the mail room, particularly make their job experience as good as possible. Do your job in such a way that it produces the most value for the most number of people. And if you start doing that and practice providing value, the immediate benefit is you're going to feel good. You're going to feel good about yourself, good about your job. Um, the long-term benefit is that you will build the muscles required to change everything about your life that you want to change because people who provide value are also the people who get the most influence. And in, in the intermediate term, you'll probably get promoted. You'll probably um, you know, be the one who's selected for awards and recognition because that's what people are looking for is who are providing value. So all you've got to do is look around and say, huh, what does the system value? And then how can I be the best yeah. at providing that volume? And one of the questions I was going to ask you, but it kind of rolls into it, was you speak of leadership and, and you know being present and working, basically working your butt off to, to see results and, and give value to other people, make it easier and all that stuff. And I was going to ask you, you know, for you know a person that is in that nine to five job that um, personally for them might not seem very high pain or whatever, um, they're looking for ways to, how, how can they become a leader in their division. And I think you hit it on the head without really answering that question um, by just being present, working hard, you know, giving, you know, being organized and all the things that you said to allow those people that are in that position of like, I know I want to lead, but how do I show it? How do I, how do I become better at my job or whatever? And you hit it on the head. Well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to make a distinction because you said uh, working hard um, and being organized and I actually think those are okay, but they don't particularly matter very much. Okay. Um, and if you've ever seen, um, you know, a uh, executive at a large company, it doesn't look like they're working harder than everything. <laughs> true, true. Um, and 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 they're not, but they are providing a lot more value. Mm. They're not necessarily working hard. So 
don't think that working hard is the way to provide value because it actually isn't. The way to provide value, and let's say you're in that situation you talked about, you're in an entry level job or a job that you don't, you're not particularly inspired by, and it's not particularly high paying, and you don't love your work, but it's what you got. Right. So what do you do? Um, the first thing I do is I would scan my environment at work for the most influential people, and they may be the people in power, but they may not. Maybe there's a peer of yours who has a lot of influence. Whatever that person says, the company tends to do. Or if, you know, the boss always checks with them to see whether it's a good idea or not. Um, Or it could be the boss. Or it could be the boss's boss. Um, And you want to track, okay, who are the people in this system that have the most influence? Hmm. Once you know um, who who they are, then you want to find out what matters most to them personally. What are they trying to accomplish? What are they scared of? What are they hopeful for? What, what, what feels good to them? What feel, what, what's a good day at the office for them? What's a bad day at the office for them? And some of those motivations are going to be selfish, and some of them are going to be non-selfish and team-oriented. Some of them are going to be for the benefit of, of the company. Some of them are going to be for the benefit of them personally. And it really doesn't matter. Just crack, you know, uh, classify them all and then work to actually make a positive, real impact on the things that matter most to the people that matter most in the system. Hmm. Uh, now, it's not brown nosing. Right. I was just going to say, it's very, it sounds like it almost, but. Well, brown nosing is trying to get those people to like you. Okay, true. Um, being nice to them, giving them extra attention, um, you know, like uh, giving them a break, you know, letting them cut in line. Sure. Uh, having lunch with them all the time or buy, you know, buying them little flowers. <laughs> stuff. All of that is brown nosing. What I'm talking about is different, which is what are their actual commitments? Like let's say someone in your system is, uh, you know, the most powerful person. The thing they most care about is um, an efficiency score. And the efficiency score is through, you know, uh, uh, as measured by a survey that goes around at certain times. Well, if that's what they care about, then figure out not just how to make your work most efficient and increase that efficiency score, but figure out what are all the who are all the people that are affecting that and actually lead them. You know, set up a, at the lunch break, go to go to the people who are saying, say, you know what, we're getting that efficiency score thing coming up. I think it'd be fun if we try to just blow our last record out of the water and be even better. So, what are your best ideas on how we could? how we could have the best efficiency score possible. Uh, and let's try and do it. And then uh, when it comes time for the survey, it happens. And then you go to the, the influencer and you say, listen, you know, I know that the efficiency score matters to you and it matters to me too. So these are some of the things I've tried to see if they made a positive impact. I'm just curious whether you think they work. And if you've got any better ideas for me, I'm all ears because I want to make this thing rock just like you do. See how that's different than browse right. nosing? It's like getting on their team, which is different than just like, hey, I want you to like me. Let me do a nice thing for you. I wrote a little card. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, that that's really, you hit it on the head. That was really uh, profound and, and really good example to, to kind of give the people um, – something that they can do in their own personal work. And that kind of leads into taking, that's kind of like a small leadership role, you know, taking the bull by the horns and saying, you know, finding little things that they're able to do to provide value, like you said, but that is taking a small leadership role or the step in the right direction towards a leadership role, correct? Yeah, absolutely. It's not, it's leading, but it's not stepping on any leader's toes or playing out of their own position. Um, And that's when, you know, when it comes time for the bosses to get together and figure out who they're going to promote, um, they basically are scanning their memory for who they felt took initiative and took leadership roles without being asked. Mm-hmm. And if you've been doing that, your name's going to come up. And if you, you know, if it's mattered, then it's going to work. Um, the only way to screw it up is to uh, is to assume that something matters to them that doesn't, and put a lot of effort into something which should matter to them or you think does, but it really doesn't. So you got to get into a dialogue about it. Right now, let's move on to. So the person takes that leadership role, they get promoted. 
It might be a small promotion, but either way, they're in a leadership role. And now their co-workers that once, you know, that gentleman or, or lady was kind of mixed in is now in charge of that group of people. How does that person transform their their thinking and, and their mindset to thinking, oh my gosh, now I'm in charge of five, eight people or more or less, it doesn't really matter, and become a good leader that other people want to follow? Do you have any suggestions for them? Yeah, absolutely. Um so the first thing is uh, um, you have to create a mindset about the people that work for you uh, in your own mind, and you have to guard that mindset very carefully because if you if you um, slip off of this train, it can be disastrous. And the train is that everything that a person does that's good, everything that you approve of that someone who works with you or works for you does, the reason why that happened is that they are a good person. Let's believe that. Hmm. And everything that is bad, everything that they did that's less than, that screwed up, that was below standards, that wasn't what you expected, that occurred because of a choice that they made, not because of who they are. Right. And then you interact with everybody in that way. So, hey, you know, um, Thank you for the, the fact that you pulled an all-nighter and got this thing on the deadline. That's awesome, and that's because of the kind of person you are. I see that in you, and I really am grateful that we have the kind of person like you on the team. Now, you happen to have done it on, wrong, on the wrong product line. You know, you said it was, we were supposed to do it on this product line. You did it on the other, and that was a mistake. And um, I understand that you made that mistake. I'm wondering, you know, what kind of choices are you making that lead to those kinds of mistakes, um, which is very different than oh, you worked hard and you made a choice to do something good. That's good, right? But you because uh, of who you are, because you're a bad person. And apologize, my you know no, my uh, right. use of language. <laughs> that's okay. No worries. Dropping the f bomb on your podcast without asking, you, <laughs> but it, it happens. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, no, very, um, yeah, no, that's a good point. You know, because I am, I like I told listeners, I am taking a promotional exam and I will be in a leadership role. Um, I am a younger person, you know, and I think, um, you know, kind of going back to the internal fears of, you know, I'm having a good time with my coworkers right now and I know when I get part in, put into that leadership position, it's going to be tough for me to adjust. Um, let's talk about the emotional level as opposed to making good decisions that we feel are good and maybe they don't turn out like you just said. What about that relationship between me and my buddies now that I am in a leadership role. Does that have to change or should it still kind of, I obviously cannot stay the same, but what would you tell me to kind of still show authority, but yet have a good casual relationship with these people? Well, you know, I believe you can be friends with anyone. You can be friends with people who work for you. You can be friends with your boss. And it's important um, to know uh, what your expectations are and that your friendship doesn't relieve them of those expectations. So um, for me, you know, I have an expectation of my friends uh, that they treat each other in a particular way. In other words, that they're nice to each other, that they support each other. Um, in, in my community and in in amongst our friends, um, it's really not okay to talk bad about someone else in the community. It's not, if you're one of my friends, it's not really okay with me if you talk bad about another friend, period. And so just as friends, uh, if I hear one of my friends talking bad about another one, I'm going to say, hey, you got to handle that. You know, don't bring that here. Take that one-on-one -on -one with that person. What You're way out of line right now. And I'll just do that man-to-man -man as a friend. Sure. And it's that same energy uh, in, in the workplace, you know, when things, uh, um, when things go south or they're, you're seeing behavior that isn't acceptable as a friend, you go to them and say, Hey, this isn't okay. And then if that warning doesn't, um, uh, doesn't do it, then, then you have to use your authority. Okay. Yeah, you know, that's uh, that's something that I think a lot of people, uh, you know, kind of like uh, there's a book out there called Buddy to Boss, and it, the, the name says it all. You know, you're, you're friends with one guy one minute, the next thing, no, you're, you're promoted, and now you kind of have to lay down the hammer and everything like that. And I think that scares a lot of people when it does come to leadership because they feel like, oh, man, I have a great relationship with this guy. Now he's, you know, what if he's coming in late? Now I'm going to have to be the person to write him up or dock him pay or whatever it may be. And that's where it gets, um, you know, kind of iffy. But like you said, you know, 
being true to yourself, being true to that individual and, you know, kind of manning up and saying, hey, you know what, this is not good regardless if I was your boss or not your boss. Um, it's something you need to shape up and you're putting me in a bad situation. Now I have to um, act on it because I'm in this leadership role. And I, I think that just... It just gets a lot of people, and it, it's personally something that I that I could see myself struggling with. But um, you know, that's I'll tell you what you know. What people really want most from their boss is opportunities to learn what is most interesting to them, hmm. um, and uh, and they want to be treated fairly, of course. Yeah, yeah. But if you if you take the time to learn what what people care about, what they want to do more of, what is exciting for them, and what is they want to learn about. And then you do your best to distribute the workload so that the people who want to learn about something get the opportunity to do stuff that's similar to that. You know, hey, I, I, you know, I know we're in product marketing, but I, I'm really, really curious about marketing communications and design and stuff like that. And then if you get a project that comes along that has a little bit of a design element to it sure. and you assign it to that person because that's what they wanted to learn, um, then that's actual, you're going to gain way more love and respect than you can ever gain by letting someone slide when they screwed up and they knew it. Yeah. No, yeah. That's, no that's, that's a good point too. And to bring it back around with um, finding those uh, mentorship and, and like coaches per se, how, how does one seek those individuals to put themselves in a better state of mind, to put themselves in a better um, relationship with their, their business, their own personal life? Do you have any suggestions for people to find help, a mentor or coach? Yes, uh, of course. Um, you know, I think this is actually a, a challenge. Um, it's difficult for people. And um, I've been really lucky to be surrounded by some really amazing uh, entrepreneurs and really amazing people who um, uh, who were able to construct for themselves the kind of life, life that they want. Um, so we've, uh, we've actually built communities um, for people to participate so that they can find people like that. And, uh, you know, one such community is the mind, money, meaning community. Um, and, uh, if you are an entrepreneur and you, even if you have an idea for a business that you want to start, um, and, it, and you're anywhere from zero all the way up to $5 million in revenue, we've built a community of people who are in it together, um, uh, using each other as mentors and guides, um, and uh, and working through all of the challenges of how to do that step by step by step, given a really solid blueprint from everything that my wife Jennifer and I have learned in the last um, in the last you know fifteen twenty years of helping uh, business people and entrepreneurs succeed. So there are on, you know there there are online communities and communities um, uh, like this all over the place. I yeah, you know I think ours is one of the most um, supportive because. Uh, when you when you come into the community and you ask for help, there's always people who really know what they're talking about, who are willing to spend the time with you, which makes it pretty special. Now, if you're not an entrepreneur and that's not a fit for you, um, you basically have to find um, a group of people. Uh, it could start with one or two who you admire what they have, you admire what they've done, and they personally have the value of contributing. You can see that the values they live by are a value of helping other people. Um, if, they, if you admire what they've accomplished and they believe in helping other people, then join that community and you both start to help other people and, and uh, you'll be able to learn what they've learned, you know, what, what they've done, you'll be able to learn from them and you'll be able to pass that on and help other people too. There's no greater way of getting the respect of a mentor who helps other people than by being the kind of person who helps other people as well. Um, so if you, if you're, uh, if you, uh, if you're not an entrepreneur and it doesn't fit for you to join our community, then, um, then, you know, try and find it that way. Uh, and if you are, then we have one already built for you, um, with literally hundreds of people who are, who are waiting to help you out. Can't wait to find out what you care about so that they can get engaged in helping you make it happen. Awesome. And to go to the entrepreneur, I, I personally believe everybody's an entrepreneur in themselves. Um, they have the ability, but there's a lot of people that just don't have that mindset. They don't have that ability to bring out the creative side. They don't have the ability to be uh, outside of the box thinker. From all your experience, all the people that you met from the startups to the, the full-time big businesses, is there a recurring theme for people to discover that entrepreneur within themselves? Or is it something that you feel that maybe 
you're kind of born with. You always just been a creative person. Do you do you feel it's either or, or do you do you feel that everybody has it within? Um, you're not born with it. It's okay. absolutely within. And and by the way, I don't even think it has anything to do with thinking outside the box or being creative. Okay. Um, you know what I notice about entrepreneurs is that they've decided that there's something that they care about uh, providing. There's a there's a value that there's a problem they care about fixing. There's a there's an opportunity for other people that they want other people to capture, and they just care about that happening. And they decided that no one else is going to do it, and it's up to them. So you know, I don't know if you've ever been a, in a situation where a bunch of guys get together for a weekend, or you have a um, you know a big birthday party at a friend's house or something, and um, and then everybody's asleep because they've been partying all night, and it's the morning, and the place is a mess, right. and you're up. And you look around and you kind of don't want to do the cleaning because, you know, you got a headache or whatever. <laughs> um, but you look around and no one else is doing it. So you just decide that you're going to do it. Like, you know what? I don't really want to do this, but I'm going to I'm going to clean so that those other guys don't have to. Maybe it's someone else's birthday and it's like that the birthday boy's house. And you don't want this guy's him and his wife to wake up to a wrecked house. So you're like, look, I'm just going to clean things up and do my share. In fact, I'm going to do more than my share. Um even though I don't want to, because it's up to me to do it. Mm. And that decision, it's up to me to do it, is all it takes to be a successful entrepreneur. You look around and you say, you know, this is stupid. Everybody in our company is using seven different pieces of software to do one thing, and then none of them can talk to each other. Mm. So I don't know anything about software. I don't know anything about technology. But I, it's going to be up to me to change that and to create something that fixes this problem for them. It's going to be up to me to clean this mess up. Um, or, you know, look, I, there's been a, um, there's, there, there needs to be a dry cleaning place on this block. There's no dry cleaning place here. Everyone goes six blocks away. Uh, you know, there's all these buildings, uh, apartment buildings and they need, you know, they need their dry cleaning. They're constantly walking all over the place. I'm going to be the one to fix that problem. It's going to be me. Yeah. So I think that's all it really takes to be an entrepreneur is to, to decide it's up to you. Yeah. One thing I say is, uh, you know, everybody, I think invented something in their own mind you know it it might be when they're cooking they realize oh this would be an easier way to do this or chopping or you know doing something in the yard we're all inventors inside I really believe we're all creative people because it just happens you know we just put two things together that you know and maybe it is an invention out there or whatever but it's it's one of those I personally think it's kind of like a mindset of are you going to wait for the product to come to you or are you going to make the product and and distribute it to everybody else and and let them reap the benefits Um, you know obviously I mean there's certain items that are are more obvious than others that pop into your mind but it's kind of one of those mindset things that um, I think we all have it within it's it's just something we need to you know uncover a little bit and and feel confident about and one of the last things I want to wrap up uh, one of your speeches a TED talk actually um, you talk about the most uh, the the dangerous question Um, do you mind going with that going off that not at all yeah so um, there's a there's a um, yeah a TEDx a TEDx and if you spell Brian with a Y, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry. And the most dangerous question, um, really it's not so much about the words of the question, but it's about where you ask it from. And it has to do with acknowledging that most of your life has been uh, has been a journey of trying to fix what's wrong with you and uh, trying to prove that you're worthy or prove that you've that you've got something, prove that you're okay, prove that you deserve to be loved, prove that you belong. Um, most of us have tried to prove that, you know, to our parents or friends, uh, to um, women or to men, to people who we felt that we didn't get that validation from and were really wanting to achieve things in order to get that validation. Um, so once you realize that, then you have to realize you're never going to achieve anything that gives you that validation. That validation can only come really from yourself. And uh, um, so if you imagine a world where you've proven everything that there is to prove, where you're okay, where you're done, where you've achieved it, where your dad's proud and your mom loves you and you got everything you needed and you're done. And uh, in fact, there's nothing to hide. There's no secrets. Any secret you possibly could have that you're afraid someone might find out has already been broadcasted over the world and you know, everybody already found out, um, you know, whatever you were hiding, whatever you weren't telling anyone, they already know. And it's okay. They didn't, they didn't freak out and they still love you and it's all good. 
from that place of total sufficiency without any needs, then what do you want? And that is a powerful question. It's a, it's a dangerous question because it can undo a lot of the work that you've been doing. You can realize that a lot of the structures you have, your relationships, your house, your job, a lot of that could, could be hinged on something that doesn't matter to you anymore. And I encourage you to be courageous and invest in what does matter to you from that place. Even if you have to fake it, even if you don't believe you're totally sufficient, spend your life creating what you would, what you want, um, what you imagine that you'd want in a place of sufficiency. Um, and the sufficiency will come later. Don't spend yourself, your life uh, trying to prove something, trying to prove something to yourself or anyone else because you won't be satisfied. It's a waste of your life. And uh, that's the essence of that. That TED talk, but I, I do recommend to the viewers that you spend the 19 minutes and and watch the whole thing because it really does walk you through that place um, in a pretty effective manner. I think. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes for sure. I I, I saw it and uh, very powerful and and you're right. Uh, you might uh, take a step back and go, oh, this is not the direction that I really need to be going in. Awesome, Brian. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, and we'll keep in touch. My pleasure, Jacob. Take care. Thank you. Thanks again to Brian Franklin for coming on the podcast. Very interesting individual, um, great ideas, tips, ways to become a better leader, and also to to figure out the problems that are going on, how to solve them, and understand philosophy of working. Um, And also, too, it's a kind of a cool podcast and cool ideas, especially for individuals that are maybe maybe your kids or some other people that you might know that are not in the highest paying jobs currently. Um, you know, maybe for this uh, podcast to them, let them hear it and let them get a better idea of where they are currently, but where they can go um, with Brian Franklin's ideas and thoughts and the w- things that he has personally discovered. So kind of interesting um, ideas from there. What did you guys think of the bleeped out swear word that Brian did? He did apologize and I bleeped it out <laughs> with a pretty strong sound and I hope it didn't startle you too much and if you're driving hopefully you didn't swerve into another car and if you're walking hopefully you didn't jump out of your shoes so um, again like always guys thank you so much for joining me on the podcast I appreciate all your support the emails you guys have been giving to me Um, also too if you guys would like to get in contact with me tell me ways of how to improve the podcast if you like the quality if you have an idea for somebody to come on the podcast feel free to email me support at Operation selfreset.com. And also, too, if you guys want to get more information about Brian, see the um, TED Talk or anything like that, head on over to Operation selfreset.com forward slash qualities of a leader, just like the title of this podcast. If you guys would like to grab that free audiobook from audible.com, head on over to audibletrial.com forward slash OSR and get yourself a free book. Um, you do need to sign on up, but the cool thing is you're able to delete your account with one click. Um, so it's a very easy process to sign up and very easy to cancel your request for in an account. Um, so it's up to you. Get your free book at audibletrial.com forward slash OSR. And the one thing I want to leave you guys with is surrounding yourself with great people, great individuals. I realize more than ever that my family is awesome. I really enjoy hanging out with them. And I don't know if that just started because I'm really digging deep into, you know, self-help, personal improvement. And I realize the best people around me that are really in my corner is my family. But also too, just realizing that you need to surround yourself with great individuals, upbeat people, you know, people that you want to become. You know, I always say, you know, change into that person that you dream of or want to become or whatever, surround yourself with those individuals. If you want to become more successful, surround yourself with successful people. If you want to open up that bakery, hang out with people that are bakers or people that just like cooking in general. If you do that, if you strive to surround yourself with the people that you want to become, at least the ideas or the things that they have accomplished, you can get tidbits of information and gravitate and and kind of become them in a way. Obviously, you're still going to be dedicated to becoming your personal best, whatever that may be, but you're able to grab different ideas and tactics and ways to improve in that direction. And I just want to remind all of you that if you take five, your five closest people that are surrounding you right now, your personal friends or maybe your best friend, maybe it's your sister, whoever, take their incomes, 
and divide it by the number of people, they'll average your income. And it might be off a little bit, you know, $10,000 swing. But mostly, if you think about it, you're hanging out with people that are usually within your bracket. And that's okay. But to get out of that rut, to get out of that normal idea set, and you guys are talking about the same things, the same problems, the same financial issues, the same you know updates to your house, the same appliances that you put in your house, the same toys you get for your kids, maybe it's time to step on out, change it up, shake it up. To improve yourself, you need to improve the people around you, and that's a tough one because you might lose some pretty cool people along the way, but that's okay because the whole point of this podcast and this idea set with resetting your life is to change. You obviously had enough of your current life. There's something going on that you need help getting better at. Leadership, you know, being more dedicated, hardworking, whatever it is. That's why you're here. That's why you're listening. Do it for yourself to start improving the people that are around you so you can improve yourself in your life, for yourself, for your family, for your friends, whatever it may be. Start doing it. And it's a tough one. That's really tough to do. And actually... The next podcast I'm going to be doing is talking about my effects that I have found by starting this podcast. And it's called Change is Not Easy. And it's about change and the transformation you need to go through and the struggles and the things that are going to come up in your own personal life to get through, to become truly, truly that person that you strive for, that person that you want to become. So I hope that inspires you to start looking in different avenues and different directions. This podcast is awesome. The information that's out on the internet and YouTube and books and ideas are awesome. They really are. But they're only as good as what you take away from them and what you use. That's why I try to give you guys just some basic fundamental ideas and tips to take with you because the complex theories and the way your brain works is awesome. It's really cool, really interesting. But at the end of the day, you're not going to use that stuff. You're going to use practical ideas, and that's what I'm trying to provide for you guys. And a practical way to improve your life is to surround yourself with people that are more successful than yourself. And I'm not talking in financial, financial only. I'm talking about in relationships. If you're struggling with somebody that, if you're struggling in your own current relationship, hang out with people that have solid relationships. If if you want to become a better cook, hang out with people that love cooking. Whatever it may be, surround yourself with individuals that you want to kind of become. Obviously, you're still going to be true to yourself and true to your mindset, but put, go give yourself in a direction, put yourself in a direction that you truly, truly want to become. Surround yourself with those individuals. They'll help guide you to that person, whatever it is that you strive to become. Again, thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. If you guys have any questions, concerns, comments, Email me, support at operationselfreset.com. And if you do have a second, please leave a review on iTunes. Go to iTunes, click Operation Self Reset, leave a review. It's right there in the middle. Pretty straightforward. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And we will keep in touch. Look forward to the next podcast. Have a great week, guys. Make it a great week. This is your week to strive for success. We'll talk to you soon.